Good morning, everyone. Borada Pau. Um, it's nice to see so many people here today. Um, as I do every year, I sort of reflect on the last year, and I'm going to reflect on what's happening or what's happened since we last met in Penrith. I'm not going to give you a blow-by-blow -blow account of the work of the National Association, because you know we, we communicate that regularly, we communicate that through our AGM and through our chairman's meeting, as Philip has pointed out later on in the year. Um, what I'm going to do is try to focus on four challenges. Um, these aren't um, challenges that I feel we can't rise to. These are four very significant and specific challenges. And then I'm going to look at four areas of opportunity and hopefully um, we can leave feeling at least those um, opportunities balance the challenges that we, we have to deal with. I want to start um, with a reflection on a report. Now this, um, as a national association, we're continually scanning for reports in order to help us make decisions. And Deloitte um, has been working with government in lots of different areas um, to produce reports that give us an indication of the, um, the workings of the UK, the UK government. And they pull together information from various sources in order to help politicians and civil service servants make informed decisions. Um, this report, sorry, I'll go back. This report um, has probably been the most um, significant one we've come across, and it confirms something of which we're all already clearly aware. We're halfway through a programme of fiscal cons consolidation designed to reduce the size of the state, and the reform required in the second half of the programme will alter the way many public bodies operate. So the next round of cuts will, without doubt, be deeper and even more significant. So there's no surprise there. We know that's happening. We know this is probably going to be set out in the autumn statement, if not before. And this really forms the basis of the um, central challenge that we're all facing. Cross-referencing this with information that we've drawn from the Office, Office for Budget Responsibility, which is an independent fiscal watchdog, we're informed that by the time we reach financial year 2018-19, government spending on public services and administration will fall to its lowest share of national income since at least 1948. Now that's when records began in this you know, it, it, gathering data for this, for this sort of information, but it's lowest share of national income since 1948. And essentially we think it's going to match something that looks similar to the post-war democratic settlement, so absolutely chimes with what Philip was saying earlier. It takes us to a period before the national parks and the AOMBs were even devised. But as Philip said, at that point resources were put aside to promote and value what we hold very dear, and it's incumbent upon us to make sure that the same messages um, come up again and again. And this reform of the public sector is forcing a significant rebalancing of the relationship between the state, civil society and business. It's essentially um, or it's essential that we continue to respond to this rebalancing in the way that we have done in the past, in a very proactive way. And the central, or one of the central questions we have to ask ourselves is, what is the role of the public sector with regards to public service delivery within the context of landscape? And we need to really sort that out, become very clear over that, over that question, and ensure that we feed our responses into discussions um, going forward. As far back as 2006, the Carnegie UK Trust launched an inquiry into the future of civil society in, UK, in the UK and Ireland. And one of its central questions, or one of the central questions it posed, was how does civil society respond to the emerging conflict between conventional economics and environmental and resource issues? And that was as far back as 2006, and we're seeing that starting to um, unfold very clearly. This was actually before the current rebalancing started, and it's now even more pertinent than it was before. So one of the clear outcomes of this rebalancing is the role of the markets in natural resource management. We're seeing it in carbon and biodiversity offsetting, habitat banking, and we're likely to see more of it as this rebalancing progresses. 
Whilst there is absolutely clearly a place for a market-led approach to nature conservation or nature management, if only to help internalise the costs that um, would normally have been externalised and actually took us down the route that we're in now, we have to ask ourselves a central question. When did we collectively agree to move to a market-based solution, to apply an economic theory tested on products and based on competition to the management of the very substances that, we are, that are required to sustain us? And do we really understand what natural capitalism is about? So what I'm not saying is that there isn't a place for this. What I'm saying is that we have to be absolutely sure what, that we understand what it means. Is the new... You know, is natural capitalism the new natural beauty? And how does natural capitalism fit with the quest for a more sustainable way of living? How do we ensure that market-based systems don't result in greater inequalities? How does compensation really work? How does development and compensation really integrate with the environmental agenda? We need to do it. And we are already starting, you know, there are companies that have been doing it for a number of years, and we're really getting into that discussion now, but how do we do it? How do we ensure that the ambition of intergenerational, intergenerational equity and intragenerational equity is actually met? If we ration the use of natural resources now, such that future generations have access to it, how can we do it in such a way that we're not creating inequalities in this generation? How do we apply environmentalism to economics rather than economics to environmentalism? Oops, sorry. And importantly, and this goes back to Philip's point, is there still a place for landscape and natural beauty? Where do A and Bs fit in this debate? What is our relevance? We know we have a place in managing natural capital, but how do we keep those public goods, the non-rival goods that sit outside the free market, on top of the agenda? Um, how, how do we keep those public goods and services in the, in the eyesight or the line of sight of politicians? So that I see as our first challenge, public sector reform that we're all involved in, but the associated rebalancing of the relationship between the state, civil society and business and finding our place within it. And we do have a place in it. We do have a place within it. We're working with partners at the moment to try and figure out that space, but we've got to be very clear as to where we where we sit within it. So the second challenge that I see is development. This is large-scale infrastructure projects such as High Speed 2. This is a, a view of the Chilterns um, as it is now. Um, so large-scale infrastructure projects, but it's not just large-scale infrastructure projects, it's small-scale incremental change. Those of you that listened to File on 4 recently will have heard Henry Oliver speaking very eloquently on the development pressure in the North Wessex Downs. And likewise, there are many voices highlighting the issues around high speed too. But it isn't just large-scale infrastructure change that we're having to deal with. The small-scale in incremental changes that occur on the fringes of villages that do nothing to consolidate landscape character and turn every village into a replica of the next also present significant challenge. Factored into that is the whole discussion around renewables and how we deal with renewables within protected landscapes. The next challenge is devolution. What does it actually mean for the AOMB family? And we're actually very, working very closely with AOMBs in Wales as this whole process starts to unravel. And my view of devolution has changed dramatically since, um, since it really started a few years ago. And I like to look at this as the sort of AOMB family growing up and metaphorically dispersing. Anyone that has children will know that the pain of children leaving home is only exceeded by the thought of them staying. Um, but what does this actually mean for the AOMB family? What does it mean for the designated landscape family as a whole? How do national parks and AOMBs work together to embrace devolution and actually make sure it takes us to a better place. And as I said, we've been working in Wales. This is a view, some of you may know it. It's actually a view from, um, on the, from the Ogwen Valley looking up to Kumidwal um, in the Snowdonia National Park, in the Ruri National Park. Um, as devolution progresses in Wales, there is the, the pressure to do things slightly differently. We know this is happening in Wales because we're part of it. It's also happening to a lesser extent in Northern Ireland. The current legislative programme in Wales 
particularly the Environment Bill, makes no mention of landscape, no mention at all of landscape. It doesn't even mention the word environment in anything other than its title. Additionally, the current review of designated landscapes in Wales may lead us down a route of totally different purposes, with no mention of natural beauty. The whole focus with regards to nature is now on natural resource management. And I use this slide because the grandmother of a friend of mine lived in this house here, which is called Pentra, and they owned Cumidwell, which was sold to the Countryside Council for Wales as a, a national nature reserve. And in the 60s and 70s, the grandparents of this friend of mine used to sell cream teas from this house to passing tourists. So this is a landscape about people. It's a landscape that's about the story of people and place. It's not just about the management of natural resources. So we have to ask our question, has Wales lost its natural beauty? Does its landscape still have value? Where is the wonder? Where is the awe? Where is the majesty? Where is the inspiration? These are complex, complex wonderful places with a great time depth. How do we reflect that in policy discussions going forward? So that, I think, was my third challenge. My fourth challenge relates to nature. 50% of our hedgehogs have disappeared in the last 10 years. 90% of our meadows have gone in the last 100 years. We're losing our pollinators. The hen harrier, the very subject of the Boland Award that the National Association gives out, is at risk of extinction. 60% of our wildlife is diminishing. I live below a moorland in North Wales and um, it's the first time in 19 years I haven't heard curlew on that moorland. So we've got a lot to play for at the moment and this is happening on our watch. So we've got to rise to this challenge. So these were my four challenges. I wanted to talk um, slightly more briefly about the opportunities that we have. And these opportunities I think are significant. The AOMB designation was made to tackle the sort of problems that we're dealing with at the moment. These are complex problems and they're about people. We're close to centres of population. We have, uh, people have access to these areas both intellectually and physically. We look at the sum of the parts. We don't just look at part of these areas. We look at the landscape. We look at the sum of the parts. We involve others. We engage them. We plan, we manage, and we help others do the same. We recognise the intangible as well as the tangible aspects of the natural environment, the bits we can't trade within a free market. AOMB teams and partnerships are fleet of foot. Um, you wouldn't believe how long it took me to find... I was searching for an image of Wales scoring a try against England. I couldn't find one at all, so I was left with this. But AOMB teams are fleet of foot. We know that. We grab opportunities, or you grab opportunities, as and when they arise, and you're quick at doing it. To give you some example, as far as contribution to our nature, as far as contribution to nature recovery goes, at the last count in England, AOMB teams are involved in 86 conservation projects. These are significant conservation projects, which include the management of 23,000 hectares of priority habitat. That's over 30 kilometres of hedgerows, 145 kilometres of river margin, over 8,000 hectares of upland peat and bog, more than 7,500 hectares of woodland, 2,000 hectares of orchard, sorry, of, of 2,000 hectares of heathland, 18 hectares of orchard, and nearly 1,000 hectares of meadow. I mean, this is not insignificant stuff. AOMB partnerships and um, staff teams are quick to seize opportunities, quick to form partnerships with others, and quick to make an impact on the ground. So you're big on impact and light on bureaucracy, which is exactly what's required during these changing times. And we regularly celebrate as a nation the bargain that is the royal family at 56 pence per person per year. AOMB teams do all of what I've just said at a cost to the taxpayer of less than 15 pence per person per year. And that is for the total AOMB family covering 8,000 square miles. And not only that, but you multiply the contribution given by local authorities by a factor of 10. So you're very, very good value for the public purse. If you wanted to look at payback, 
Just looking at tourism alone, over 100, around 150 million people visit AOMBs annually, spending in excess of $2 billion. And that's, as I said, just tourism. If you look at the total gross value added for AOMBs, it comes to around £16 billion. Pounds. AOMBs are clearly good for business. And you're big on collaboration. Um, I think we could argue we could all be bigger on collaboration, but we're big on collaboration. And just to highlight what I mean by collaboration, collaboration is a process through which people who see different aspects of a problem can constructively explore their differences and search for solutions that go beyond their own limited vision of what is possible. And that for us means working outside of our sector, working with business, working with others in order to solve problems. You collaborate at a local level, you collaborate within the family, you collaborate outside the family. You collaborate on a national level through the National Association, which in turn collaborates with governments and other national bodies, keeping you relevant on the national stage. You have the power to convene, to pull people together around a common purpose. This is incredibly powerful and is a significant opportunity going forward. And we consistently as a national association hold true that to overcome many of the environmental issues that we're currently facing, we don't need institutional change, we need behavioural change and we need those institutions that we represent to be supported fully to enable this change. And the final opportunity is that of the National Association for AOMBs, for us. The National Association is now a registered charity with some pretty exciting objects. Last year in Penrith, we weren't. We were a company limited by guarantee. We didn't have a charitable function. We weren't a registered charity. But this is your registered charity. It's not ours. It's your registered charity. It's up to you what you do with us. We work for you. We're all about natural beauty, so looking at our objects, we're about natural beauty, but not only in and around AOMBs, we can also work with other protected areas. We can also work with areas that are pursuing designation. We're about education, understanding, all those things you'd expect of a charity. We're also about promoting the efficiency and effectiveness of those organisations charged with managing AOMPs. So we're a charity with a broad, a broad remit, and I can't stress more highly that we are your charity. We're a department of your partnerships. We operate on your behalf, and we do this as efficiently and as effectively as possible. So be involved in it, own it, get involved. So just to recap, four challenges. One is public sector reform but it's the associated shift in the relationship between environmental management and economic decision making that I think we can really make a big impact in, over. Development pressure of all shapes and sizes, but we really need to get a grip on that. Devolution, and it doesn't just affect Wales or it doesn't just affect Northern Ireland, this is an issue for all of us. And wildlife loss, they're really the four central challenges that I see going forward. But we've got four significant opportunities. One about the absolute relevance of the AOMB designation. These are designations by people, um, for people. The way you operate, your fleetness of foot, your light touch, bureaucracy, and your value for money. Your willingness to collaborate at all sorts of levels and the potential you have to generate more. And the National Association is a national charity, your charity. And part of what we're doing as a charity is to set up a commercial proposition, to set up um, a consultancy as part of that charity. This isn't to compete with other consultancies out there. This is to allow us to collectively operate under one banner and feed money and resources back into AOMB management on the ground. And there'll be talk later on in conference about that. So enjoy the conference, share, learn and be inspired. And I'd like to end on this quote, as it does it for me. Call it a clan, call it a network, call it a tribe, call it a family. Whatever you call it, whoever you are, you need one. Thank you.